Well, chat, here we are. The follow-up review to Isom, Isom 2 by Eric July, Black Comic Book Man, a uh, guy who Juju the Cow, a.k.a. Dax Herrera, hates with every fiber of his being, to the point where he promoted a pedophile's drawing book uh, and even crowdfunded him from his own audience the money to finish this drawing book, which to this day uh, the pedophile Vito Giswaldi had never finished. Uh, he made so much money, I think it was like $70,000 that he made off of Juju's audience, uh, that he broke down in tears, so happy that he could finally pay somebody to draw naked a girl he had a crush on in college who died. Uh, but we're not talking about Juju the Cow or uh, Vito Giswaldi, the pedophile in his comic book. We were talking about a black comic book man and Isom too. Uh, here we have it. I actually have two copies of this book. Um, I bought one in, like, preserved packaging <laughs> for a collection, I suppose, that I have started of comic books, of meme comic books. I actually have all three comic books of Rusty Cage, which I haven't read, and I have Butch Killigan, um, which is by Sven Stoffels, and I will make reference. Now, because when I started uh, talking about Isom, I had literally never read a comic book before, and I just kind of went in dry. And to recap my first review, um, it's sort of like a crime book, crime story, where, and it's a very grounded story. And there's a guy, he's a rancher in Texas, and his family friend has been sex trafficked. It's a very contemporary, modern story. So he's going to go and investigate where she went and uh, confront the crime, crime boss and get her back. And uh, for whatever reason, and when I say that, it's because Eric July is big into comic books. There's like this superhero subplot where he's a superhero and there's a superhero that's like a bad superhero. It's called like an except. And then there's like a world of superheroes. And I said in my first review that this all felt very needless and distracting. <laughs> you had a very simple story of a man trying to to hunt down a family friend against um bad odds with an organized crime boss. And there's all this weird fantasy stuff that I, I, when I think of superheroes, I think of like Superman and Spider-Man. I don't really think of like sex trafficking. So I thought that that was weird. Um, but nothing would have prepared me for Isom 2. Um, this is a bad comic. And I say that having only read two comics. <laughs> well, I guess three. Um, it's a comic that has a extreme lack of focus. I want to say, it's kind of hard to say, but I think it's like 60 pages. And despite its length, I do have this picture. By the way, um, in this, I'm going to be showing scans. And the scans kind of wash out the colors. The colors in this are just wonderful. Um, I believe that the artists involved have done a wonderful job, um, with a couple exceptions. But the colors just pop great. Um, it's a beautiful book. Um but I really, I couldn't wait to be finished with it, <laughs> which is, I realized that these are very short, these comic books. So when I'm flipping through this, I'm just like, God, I can't wait to be fucking done reading this. Um, it's a bad sign. It's like, it's short, but I still have ran out of patience for it. And that's because I believe there's four subplots happening. Like the story is told um, um, anachronistically. It's it's very weird. It's not like full fight club. It's like, what the fuck is going on? It's just like, there's four different things happening in four different places. And it doesn't, it doesn't have any cohesion whatsoever. You don't understand how A and B tie together. And the big problem is, um, in the first book, he gets into the crime fighting stuff to rescue Jasmine, this girl. And there's one specifically one mention of Jasmine throughout the entire fucking book. So this book could, could very well be, it's the first, it could very well be the first book in the Isom series for all the, the tie in that it has with the, the original. Um, so I'm going to pull up the scan. And again, I, I, I literally have two of these. So I just got lazy and I did not want to scan this myself because I don't have a scanner. Um, but I do, I do physically own this book. Okay, so the book opens in, like, nondescript office building. And my first big issue with this is that you can see 
black lady is going into this extremely she's the chief technology officer so she's like a c-level executive in this this office building and she has to do like a biometric scan to get in so you can see she's in this dark room she's getting in she opens and this is kind of weird i thought this was a hologram at first this is supposed to be like her shadow entering the door and then she's immediately confronted by um darren fontano who is the main bad guy um in the first book but from this angle you can see that the the, the it's not dark so it's like dark in this right but when we um look at what she sees when she walks in she would be able to clearly see that all these goons are at this desk and you can see the door she just walked in through right here so how is she possibly ambushed walking in through this door when the bad guys are like right in front of her and like she should open the door see these guys and then just be like oh fuck this and then leave um and then also there's this like <sighs> I think that this was like, a, if I was like Juju the Cow and I was trying to make a meme about this comic book, the rhetorical slap would be something that I cut out. And I would ask, um, like, you know, he loves to do that joke. How many push-ups can he do? I would ask that. And then if they ever answer, I would just hit them with the rhetorical slap because it's not, <laughs> it's not like a literal answer. I don't know if he did that, but it would be, it would be funnier than he's usually. Um, so again, my first big gripe right off the series, like the sequence of events is like this woman is ambushed in her own office. That's apparently very secure by somebody she could have seen. It, there's like a, um, a, a, a trick to the eye when she is like, they're pretending that it's like a dark corridor, but she's just immediately ambushed. Then regardless of the fact that she was ambushed in an office, she should have been able to see as she walked through the door. Um, apparently they were wise to the fact that these bad guys, Darren had broken into this tech office anyways. So, um, we have like an entire fucking counter-strike go, uh, counter-terrorist team breaking in, beating the fuck out of the main bad guy already. And it's just like, oh, so the problems resolved then, right? Like he's like, I think this is the office building of like the superhero complex that Isom actually belongs to. So it's like, there's the bad guy. You have him. You have his entire crew. So you could negotiate whatever terms for releasing, uh, what, what's her face. Right. So there's no problem solved immediately on page 10. It looks like what's, what's the issue. So we immediately go from the main bad guy being wrapped up to this weird years ago thing. So we've already broken the chronological order of the comic book. We're now years ago. And this is the explanation of how Avery lost his mojo as a, as a superhero. So he rushes into this comic book convention, ironically, and helps this girl and uh, her boyfriend or friend or, or whatever off the ground. And it's like, hey, let me escort you out of this convention center that's been torn apart. Then somehow, and again, this is like a common theme in the in the book that I have a problem with, even as somebody who doesn't read comic books. This guy has approached Avery out of nowhere. Like out of nowhere. Where is he coming from? How did he this guy is like an eight foot tall orc? He's like three hundred pounds of pure muscle. How do you not hear him? How does he sneak up on you? He's like directly next to Avery and the people he's trying to save are only like a few feet away. So there's a brief fight and then the orc randomly says, Umba lore, and then starts super fast chasing after the, uh, the girl in the costume. And I think it's kind of implying that she is dressed up as a superhero that he's actually trying to kill. So he rushes over there. And this is one of the, the worst parts of the entire comic for me. So if you look at this page, you can see the level of detail given to this character's ass. It is drawn like almost center. Like, I mean, the only ass drawn more in detail is Avery's. But hers is right next to her, his ass. And they're both drawn in detail. So then we go over here. And this is the action sequence that is supposed to have impacted Avery so much that he decided, I can't do this. I can't do this. And if we look at her face and how this is drawn, this is like such a brutal thing is like, she's pulled down by, this is just like a random girl at like a convention. She's pulled down by her hair 
And then this is her face of mortal terror. And it looks like the kind of face you would draw on like a background character. It's like you see a full colored, well drawn face for Avery and his reaction to what he understands is about to happen. But like for the, the, they can draw her ass just fine. But when it comes to drawing her face and how she reacts to her own mortal per- peril, it's like, what, like, honestly, it's like, is it like it's supposed to be like cast in shadows to look scary, but it just looks bad. Uh, and then he just smashes her skull, like how you would crush like Play-Doh between your fingers. It's kind of fucking brutal. Um, there's more pages between that and this one where they have no issue drawing like her body, but um, they do have an issue drawing her face, apparently. And I only bring this up because I know that comic books are like kind of etchy in terms of what they show. And that's kind of the point. Um, but I feel like it's a little bit inappropriate to do that with the girl who exists only to have her skull crushed. Uh, I don't know if that's feministy or what, but that's how it, it comes across to me. The next sequence is in like a house with his friend explaining what's happened. So again, we've gone from current time, Darren situation years ago, back to current time. But now we're in somebody's house where he's kind of talking to a friend about his trauma. Okay, so we walk away from the therapy session. He goes inside this, like, military complex, and I don't know why. Um, But then we have this. This is the exact same error as before. He's walking through a door, and then there's an ambush. But we can see that the background has windows. Where, like, look at this. these eyes. I assume that these were bats at first, because it's like, realistically speaking, if this thing has a body... It would occlude the windows. So why the fuck are the eyes just right there? It, like, this honestly looks unfinished. Why are the fucking windows there? Or I guess that's not even windows. Uh, those are monitors, because they turn off at this point. Why are the monitors there? Is, oh, is he behind the monitors? Oh, that's what they're trying to say. He's behind the monitors. It just looked wrong, though, is the issue. Okay, I got it. But then this is what... It, oh, now they're in front of the monitors. I guess that's why you can see them, because they're in front of the monitor. Where the fuck would they stand behind those monitors? The monitors are on the wall. Bro, I'm sorry. This is just an error. Like, this is just like a, a space-time fucking issue. They're flying bats in this scene, and then you get to here, and they're like giant monkey men. And wait a second. Why do they only have two eyes when they're in bats? But then when they're, like, standing there, they have four eyes. Dude. I'm telling you, this is unfinished. These two, these two frames right here are just not done. Yeah, that's not good. Like, and that this isn't just me nitpicking. Like when I was flipping through it, when I got to the sequence, I was like, "What the fuck is happening?" So the monkey men start a fire, and then there's four guys on horseback to discuss what's what's happening. He got injured, by the way. That's part of the plot. But um. I, this is a great example. This right here at the very top is a great example of the um, lack of, of organization or structure in the comic. Um, like, we've just gone from dark office building to a convention center, which kind of fit the theme of, like, modern contemporary time to, like, evil demon monkeys in a high-tech lab, kind of like Doom. And then we're outside, and it's like a Wild West in terms of how it looks. And it's, it's very jarring. Um, and it gets even worse as it goes on. And there is a hero introduction for some guy called Gooding, and I'm pretty sure he's the guy that runs the big base that they're in. Okay, and now we jump again. Gooding rushes into the building to fight the fire. Hard cut to the Alpha Core headquarters. I want to stress, I don't think that these guys are ever introduced at any point in the first book. And if they are, it's only in brief. Like, I think they're discussing something. Um, but we have not, I have no idea who these fucking people are. Um, but we're at like another location. This is location number five. And they continue to hype up Yaira, which I think is like another standalone comic that's being done by, um, by the, the ISOM, like the, the production team. Uh, but this is very apropos of nothing. This comes out of nowhere. Uh, Yaira is also mentioned very, like she has a very brief appearance in the first one. 
Uh, so it feels like they're really building up this character and how, like, as they say, rarely am I ever tested. And when given the opportunity, I gave her the out. She took it. And now we see that she ignored our negotiation. So she's like a big fucking deal is what they're trying to say. Smash cut back to the ranch. Mr. Gooding has put out the fire. Uh, there's also this page, which I is like an advertisement for the in-world gooding services. And it's like, is this a reference to everybody being like pissy about the, the advertisement for his wife's stuff in the first book? Is this supposed to, cause I'm, I'm a, someone told me that it's normal for comic books to have uh, advertisements in them. So I guess he was just like, Oh, my comic book is a real comic. So I'm going to have an advertisement too. Let me just advertise my wife's stuff. And then it's like in this comic, it's like, well, we still need to have advertisements, but people didn't like that we're paying, you know, $40 for a comic book and then it has an ad in it. So let's just do like a fake ad. That's my assumption of what this is, because otherwise it's just a little bit bizarre. It's not even like an adequate like chapter separator. Because again, on the very next page, now where the fuck are we? I guess we're at his house, right? Um, Yeah, I like just hard cut from the, the ad to this. And I don't know why they felt the need to put a chapter separator here because there's been all sorts of hard cuts, like three of them already, and there was no um, adequate lean into each other. So it's like, why does why does smash cutting to his license plateless truck <laughs> warrant a uh, warrant a, a smash cut? So now the timelines are merging again. Um, this lady, who's the lady, by the way, she's the go- woman who. I think even, wait, hold up. Hold up. Okay, I got the original isom here. Let me flip through it. Okay, there's the iris stuff. Yeah, wait, hold up. The Projexus headquarters. This is the woman in the first comic book who's telling Avery um isom about the messing friend and she she just captured darren at her office keep that in mind this is the woman who started off the sequence of events in the first book about the missing girl and she just caught darren in her office okay so then after the sequence, he goes, I'm going to kill him. And it's like, okay, well, good thing that she, that they just caught him, right? He's back at his fucking office. He's back at Club Merc and he's at his desk. Like, that's not a, what the fuck. Um, I will remind you how they captured him. Here we go. And it even says Projexus. So I'm not wrong. He broke into the headquarters of the initial event. I'm going to, I'm going to take a fucking picture of the original comic book and show you. Okay, here you go. Sorry. I know it's like, this is why I'm using a scan because it's difficult to take a picture of my phone for this, but the, the, obviously that's the same woman. So now it's really confusing. Now that I'm really thinking about it, it's not just some woman who Darren's retaliating against. It's the woman, the first person who knew that Jasmine was missing, that sent Avery after to get her. And then Darren goes to her headquarters in this extremely secure facility that's so on top of its game that they knew that he was coming, specifically, and they even say in the book, in the second one, that the founder of Projexus, Proge- Progenexus was aware that he was coming. And he knew and allowed the situation to unfold to capture him. But then when he is captured, and when the chief technology officer knows that he is the guy that has Jasmine, who she is the friend with, they just let him go. They don't call the police. They don't kill him. They don't allow Avery to come up and let him go. And I'm reading through this on the second time, but I'm going to extra pay attention to the dialogue to see if there's any fucking reason for why they're doing this. So I, I really hate this frame. So he just got captured, right? And he's complaining to his goons, who are also all free, about how their plan got foiled, even though there are no consequences for their plan foiling. He says... So I pay all of you this money and you have the nerve to withhold information. Hmm. Get out of this contract or get out. This contract is done in luck and good luck finding any work that's remotely comparable. And then uh, this other black guy says, you don't think that's a bit of an overreaction boss. And he says, shut up before I fire you too. 
and he's telling his ex up. So the guy that Avery beat up in the first book to get out. What I really hate about this is that in a story, regardless of what kind of a story it is, you need a real competent threat in order to drive the story. Like, to, I mean, to compare this to real life, like Liz Fong Jones is such a contemptible villain in the story of the Kiwi Farms because he's so competent, because he's so interconnected, and because he poses a real genuine threat to the forum and to everybody involved in it um, and anyone who knows me. So it's like it's real easy to talk about how fucking evil he is because he is evil. Comparatively, Darren seems like a fucking buffoon. He flies off the handle. He fi fires people he needs. He gets caught. Somehow he gets out. But at that point, it's like he's less of a of a villain and more of like um, a, a Warner Brothers cartoon villain, like G like Tom and Jerry. He's like he gets skinned alive, and somehow is okay. And it's just is it's like slapstick, like. How can you take this guy seriously? And then it it almost feels like the book is ashamed of having a normal guy as like a villain because they very quickly move on to some other kind of threat towards the end of the book. But before they move on, though, he says to this lady, hey, make sure Jasmine makes it back to my office ASAP. And his face is all shaded. So... This is implying that he's going to, like, rape her or hurt her or something because she is forced to be, like, a prostitute in his club merc. Um, and it's like, how the fuck was this allowed to happen? <laughs> this, by the way, is the only mention of Jasmine. It didn't even occur to either of them that he's still, like, a threat to this person that he apparently is after to try and save. And now this I don't even understand. So we cut from that, the office, to the Obertonic Arena, and there's like a fucking superhero rodeo or something. And I have no idea what the fuck this is. What is this? Why is this in the book? What is this? Have? This is the part of the game or not the game, but the book where I'm like flipping through it. Like, what the fuck am I reading? And I'm getting impatient with it because I'm like, I'm now in another location I don't recognize with more characters I don't know. And I don't even know what the fuck this is. Is this like a like a WWE thing? There's like a squared circle thing happen. I, I just I, I'm fucking lost. Why is this in? And that whole sequence just terminates with this guy shutting off a TV. So it doesn't really seem to have any impact in the immediate story. So long story short, that guy goes through a magic portal hooks up with an evil boss lady, gets this car, and then gets into a drive-by shooting with these other goons. Now, they're driving down the road really fast, based on the lines that I'm seeing. Kind of implies some speed. And the guy says, the boss sends his regards, and then they start shooting at him. Now, I'd like to reenact this in real life. The boss sends his regards. So some more shit I don't understand happens. This guy that we're following, I don't know if I'm supposed to recognize him. Like, there's so many fucking characters in this book, I can't keep track. There's, like, a fight over the steering wheel. He crashes out of his fucking window, and then it cuts again. And there's no, like, there's no, like, badge right there. Like, oh, we're now, um, we're now at this location. Like, where the fuck are we? How did we cut from page 59, this car crash, to page 60, wherever the fuck this is? Is this, like, this, is he, like, is the guy from the car crash about to fling down this fucking stairwell? Like, what is, <laughs> I don't understand what's going on, bro. I'm trying my best. So then, like, a good in person comes up and says, hey, let's go. So they hook up with this robot. And the robot is like a jet, and you have to, like, stand in these little troughs. I remember watch, watching this the first time and thinking, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I get that Avery has to be cool, but, like, this this thing is, like, shooting, like, rocket fuel out of its feet, and you're, like, experiencing multiple G-forces, and you're just going to, like, sit there and, like, hug his shoulder real cool. Um, I don't know. I would be afraid of, I w like, I have a bad fear of unsecured uh, heights. So I would be, like, hugging this fucking robot like it was the love of my life at this point. Okay, so now he's explaining the fire monkeys to this lady. He says, All right, forgive me for repeating myself, but I think it's only right that we left let Mrs. Williard in on what happened today. When I arrived at the security house, the door was open. I walked in, and Sam was nowhere to be found. I was ambushed by two beasts, and they set the building on fire. She goes, what? And then literally fucking collapses because I guess her husband said, I don't know who her husband is though. I apologize. I'm 
<laughs> By the way, I thought this was a 64 page comic. It's 115 fucking pages. You like it gets fucking weirder. Like we're only halfway through, and at the end, it's just absolute nonsense. So the geneticist man explains that the monkeys are like genetic freak mutant dangers or something. So he puts on the Ison costume because now he has to be a superhero again. Now he didn't have to be a superhero to find Jasmine. So he couldn't find a, a slave girl at a club where he was aware that she was at. But now that the giant flaming monkeys are running around Texas, he's like, oh, hell no. I ain't, I ain't standing for no flaming monkeys. You think, you think, you think I want to have some flaming monkeys running around? Fuck that bitch. So now he's a superhero. Like, okay, I got you. A uh, personal aside, um, the obvious Photoshop aerial font fucking signs in this, like this one and this one, this really bothers me. I don't know why. It's like they went in and changed it last second and just slapped on like completely unintegrated fonts into this feels unfinished as well. You have the fucking truck, a license plate. Also, I don't want to complain too much about like art shit. Cause a lot of the art is fine. And like I said, in the actual physical book, the colors really pop. The, the scan does not do it justice, but this in particular, I swear this fucking truck is like a 3d model. And I, I don't really care. I, I know that like the 3d model shit is like a big meme with like the retards, like Juju, the cow and, and the pedophile. But the truck is really like standoutish to me in part because these little, like little hairlines, you see these like hairs like right here and right here and right here. It's like they had the model. They put the model in. And then they added like this really lazy filter to it to try and give it a comic booky look. And the it's just those little scribbles are just so obvious to me. Like, like that's that's not drawn. A human being would never draw these little like because they look like pubes caught in, caught in the scanner or something. They look bad. It's like a human would not draw that detail. Um, they they just wouldn't. So it, that really really stands out to me. And I'll give you a comparison of what it looks like to me. Okay, so this is the trailer for Dustborn. And there's a sequence where they put a filter on all the models to try and give it this, like, 2D, like, asteroids look. And it looks really fucking bad. See it? You see how, like, cheap and shitty that filter is? Because they're trying to, they're just trying to very cheaply change it so that the 3D models are outlined in such a way. And it just looks, like, really lackluster, the effect. Um... So that's what that reminds me of, like the the pube thing. It's just like this is just like a cheap shader. Like you can do this in Unity for like no time at all. Okay, and this is where this shit really fucking falls apart for me. So he just put on his super suit and he goes to this nondescript castle. As it says, a castle smack dab in the middle of Texas. So imagine medieval fucking castle. Let me show it to you. Medieval fucking castle, middle of Texas, surrounded by a fucking moat. In in the in the desert. To be fair to the Goodings, it makes sense. This is the type of real estate you think is helpful. Think a helpful person would prefer. This line of work, you either suspend your sensibilities, or someone or something will do it for you. Just don't expect. You ju don't just expect the unexpected. You embrace the ignorance and learn to understand. I'm not seeing everything, and I can only be surprised by insisting that I have. And then says, hello, I was sent by Gooding. And then he, there is a fucking, like, okay, this is the third fucking time. The fourth time, actually, because it happens twice. There are two growling wolves. So that somehow, somehow he's on a fucking suspension bridge in the middle of the fucking desert, in the middle of Texas, surrounded by crocodiles. And despite the the situation that he's in and how high, you know, his alertness should be, fucking wolves sneak up on him on the suspension bridge there's only one way to approach him and there's no way he wouldn't hear like claws on the bridge and then a fucking dragon out of nowhere he's in the middle of the fucking desert he can see a million miles in every direction because it's fucking desert and a dragon out of nowhere in the middle of the night also catches him by the sur by surprise this is a genuine storytelling problem. Um, Eric July does not have the ability 
to progress the plot and storyboard surprises in a way that makes sense. It doesn't make sense when it's the girl in the the um in the convention and the guy comes out of nowhere. It doesn't make sense when it's the monkeys in the computer room. It doesn't make sense when it's the woman walking into her office and it doesn't make sense with the fucking dragon. Like it, it just, um, I can't suspend my, my, my disbelief. It doesn't make any sense. The, the situations where he is or other people are taken by surprise exist only to further the plot in a specific series of events. And, Maybe if it was extremely narratively satisfying the way it was told, I would be able to enjoy it a little bit more. But like with this, it's just like the thing happens. She's taken by surprise and then it's resolved on page 10 and it starts on page what? Six, six. So in four pages, this plot is taken care of. And it's, it's just, that is really, really lazy. So then the animals, the wild fucking animals attack him. And he's fighting gators and wolves. And someone says, stand down. And it is this black hoe, Sydney Bloodruth. And when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, what the fuck? The very first thing that jumps to my, uh, my mind is the grave robber from Darkest Dungeon. It's like he took this character, and I'm assuming that she's based off like a trope, like the big pilgrim hat and stuff, but it just looks so much like her. And it's like, yeah, that, but black, and show some tummy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just feels like, and again, this is the same book with the, the police and the gangsta and the woman getting her skull crushed, and then we're like, Sydney Bloodruth, the grave robber from Darkest Dungeon, but black, and she has a dragon. Does she, like, does she do, like, the Skyrim yells, too? Is she gonna go Fusrada at any point? Like, what the fuck? There's even, like, a, like, a library in this, where she's, like, studying spells, and I'm just thinking, like, what the fuck? And I honestly, I can't even be bothered to read all this text. Like, whatever the fuck is happening at this point, I'm not invested in it. And I kind of want to compare this to the other comic that I mentioned. So this is Butch Killigan Volume 1 by Sven Stoffels. And Sven is both the writer, storyboarder, and artist responsible for the comic. And I love the art in this. I really love Sven Stoffels' style. The way that he draws is awesome. I've commissioned uh, animations from him. He is a very talented artist, and he obviously has an interest in comics. And this um, book is the exact same length as Isom 2. It's 118 pages. But I remember this being much, much shorter. And it's because there's almost no narrative to it. And Sven is able to really take full use of the medium and, like, genuinely trip you with some crazy visuals. And this is one of my favorites. Like, and I think this is a homage to, like, some proper, like, fancy artwork. And it's, but it's just, it's just awesome. And it really gives you a sense of, like, the fucking fear and dread and, like, like craziness of, of the story. And Sven is able to do that because he's he has a perfect mental conception of what he's trying to accomplish. Whereas Eric July has, like, his plot points and then he has to go through other people. And, you know, that's, that's a, a limitation, but I don't think it's the, the sole fault. It's just that Sven has a very clear visual way that he wants to convey certain things. And compared to this, and it's like, like the, the art in this, let me pull up the book again, because the art on this scan just looks really bad for this page. And I'm wondering, because it's like so dirty looking, I get they're trying to make it look like, oh, this is like a dusty old, dusty old book where, um, you know, it's a super secret library and all sorts of stuff. I'm curious if it's that fucking bad in the book. Uh. It is, actually. It's a, it's not so washed. The colors are much, much better. But it's still just like, it's, it's like eight panels and they're just in a, in a library talking about monkeys. And I, and I don't get it. <laughs> She's just trying to take them to the monkey cave. So they fly to the monkey cave and he's just like holding on to this poor dragon's foot. Like he super jumps up and like, and like grabs its foot. And I'm just like, what? Okay. So after, uh, pulling out that dragon's ankle, 
he just like airdrops in like he's <laughs> He just jumped off the Fortnite battle bus. Remember, he had issues fighting two of these things in that that office building. But then he found, and look, you can see the monkey up here is like, it looks like Sasquatch in that one photo where he's just like from far away. So he just like drops off the battle bus into the cave of evil monkeys and just starts like whooping them. Um, This is actually, the art at this this point is really nice. And I don't want to undersell this. Um, the use of red and stuff, I, I loved it. I loved how the drawing and the colors were, but I don't know what the fuck is happening is the issue. Um, we Again, the, the plot of Isom 1 is to find Jasmine. The main bad guy is rounded up immediately and then let go for no reason. And then he's just suddenly out for vengeance for this woman's husband that died in the monkey attack. So then he's in the monkey cave and she's using like blood magic, which is also fucking weird. Um, I mean, kind of cool, I guess, but what the, f- <laughs> what does that have to do with science monkeys? So he's just having a big monkey attack going on. He's like clobbering monkeys. Ah, no, die monkeys. Like seriously, look at this. It's really, really cool in the comic book. Um, but it's like, it's that service of nothing. It's the exact same thing with like Darren. Okay. You're building up Darren as this villain. But then Darren's caught and nothing happens. And then like, okay, the monkeys are attacking Gooding and killing people. Okay, well, let's just find an old book in a castle somewhere. And then we're going to fly right on over to Monkey Town. We're going to land some fucking critical hits on the monkeys. Like, (laughs) is there no restraint at all? So then they're fighting together and they're like, oh, my God, we're both like crazy people. That's awesome. And then he says, I assumed you would stay at range. But then she explains that she's the grave robber and she has a utility set that allows her to be effective at positions one, two, three and four. So then they wander deeper into monkey cave and there are lots of monkeys. And she goes unreal. That is so many monkeys. And then Avery's just like, you know what? I'm not done killing monkeys. So they go into the monkey pit and just start like killing all the monkeys. There's one, two, three pages of monkey murder. And then she like channels all her blood magic and goes brack and starts murdering fucking, I guess the wall there. She's blowing up like a door. Yeah. It's like a sci-fi door in the monkey cave. Oh my God. They found them. All the dead people. And then this guy as well, Sam, He did it. Through use of his superpowers, he was able to bring the grave digger or the grave robber into the monkey pit and then save the bad people. He's still out there beating up monkeys, though. He had issues with two of them. Now he's he's got the suit on, so he's okay. And she can, like, create... You know how, like, in Frozen, there's that scene where Elsa makes, like, freezy sticks that she walks on? The grave robber can kind of do that with blood. That's kind of cool, I guess. Yep. Still killing monkeys. Now the dragon's killing monkeys. Then Avery goes, and he goes flying away from the monkeys. Boom. I hope you have enjoyed Isom 2. Eric, I did not. (laughs) Um, The plot was completely nonsensical. There's so much going on, but so little at the same time. Um, there was a lack of visual storytelling. Uh, I thought that the lack of characterization to the girl that was murdered was a bit fucking tasteless. And honestly, after reading it twice now, I don't know what the fuck is happening. And there's nothing to like make me think, oh, I want to read Isom 3. And I did genuinely at the end of Isom 1, I said, oh, you know, I like this kind of down-to-earth plot about the missing girl. I'm kind of curious what happens. Does does he find her? And now I'm in Isom 2, and I have no fucking ish- and I have no I have no clue what's going on. I don't know how Jasmine ties into anything. Apparently, the characters themselves have forgotten that Jasmine is like a thing. So if they don't care, why do I? Why do I care? How could I possibly want to read Isom 3 after this? Because it's like... It it kind of feels like what happened with this is Eric July got access to the candy jar. He got a bunch. I'm not saying that he got high on cocaine. I'm saying he got a bunch of money. 
He had financial success because he tapped into a market that was desperate for someone who gave a fuck about what, what they wanted. And then he had all these financial resources and all these this access to these wonderful artists. And then he as a writer is just kind of looking at this like, well, I need a story that has X, Y, Z, because these are my favorite things in comics. I like um, gritty crime that is interesting to black guys, and I like... Um, super cool Elon Musk type people like, um, Iron Man. And I like, um, uh, black witches and, and I like demons. And it's like, he just kind of matches together and you're, it, there's zero restraint. It doesn't feel like there's anybody at his, his office talking to him and going like, Hey, you need to like, let this play out a bit. You have all these ideas and there's nothing wrong with being an idea guy if you can sell it, but you need to show restraint and you need to pace things out and you need to flesh out things so that when big action sequences that you're paying the best artists in the industry to color brilliantly and draw beautifully, when that happens, there's like an emotional payoff to it and people understand what's going on. Like I understood what's going on in, in Butch Killigan that when the, you know, the, the, this sequence happens, it's like, I understand what's happening and it's, it's very rewarding to, to see the illustrations and they're super creative. You know what I mean? So it, like reading through Isom is just, Isom 2 is just a chore. It's so long and there's so much exposition and none of it is like developing anything that I'm interested in. And then the, the cool visual payoff at the very end is it, at surface of nothing. Like what the fucking monkey, where, are, where is he? Why is he in the castle killing monkeys? I don't get it. Um, I guess because they fucked with Gooding, but who the fuck is Gooding? <laughs> Why do I care about his employees? Maybe he's an asshole. Maybe he's like a rapist or a pedophile or something. I don't fucking know anything about him. Why do I care? I know who Jasmine is. Okay. And I know who the family friend is. And I, and I get that he's like a superhero. So it's like, okay, prove it. Finish, finish. Okay, bro, you, you got like a quest list on the top right of your HUD that has like eight different things in it right now. And the first one is the beginner tutorial quest, find fucking Jasmine. And he still haven't done it. And he's apparently the most incompetent buffoon fucking guy ever. You can clear out an entire dungeon full of fire monkeys, but you can't go kill the one monkey who's in this club firing his entire like crew. No, that guy is too competent and cool and slick and hard to deal with. And the, the, Whatever, man. It's, it's, it was a very, very frustrating read. And I did. I sat down with the comic in my fucking hands, and I got all comfy for it, and I got a drink and a coffee, and I, I sat down, and I, I read it just like it should be read. Um, and I wanted to like it, because I don't want to say things that Juju the Cow and Vito the Pedo are going to the clap. I don't want that, okay? It does not bring me joy to shit on something that somebody worked very hard on and that a bunch of people had invested themselves into. So I don't know if there's an ISM 3, um, but if th if this review is interesting to people, I'll fucking buy it and review it, I guess. Uh, I don't know, though. It was, it was, it's just bad. And I can see, I can see even from like a non-comic book mind, like it's, it's an, it is an issue with Eric July because the illustrations and stuff are fine. I did, I was a little bit insulted by the 3D model of the truck because it felt really lazy. Like if you're going to use a model, at least go in by hand and add the details and the dirt and stuff yourself. So it's not just a fucking, um, lazy shader, like a fucking video game. Aside from that, it's like you have, you have everything you could possibly want except, the restraint to dole things out slower, more methodically. And that's the thing that you can't make up in a, in a story. Like everything, every piece of medium is supposed to try and convey an emotional state to the audience. And you can't do that if you have a meandering and narratively unsatisfying and very unfocused story by an amateur author and writer. You need people who, who know how to hit those beats and, and convey things in a way to draw in the audience and, and keep them invested. And, and I wasn't. Um, I, I was invested up until, I think, after the flashback. After the flashback where he just leaves the... the, the he literally walks out of his therapist's office on a military base into a, a fire monkey confrontation. I'm, I'm like, bro, I don't know what the fuck's happening. I'm sorry. I'm clocked out. And the second read really didn't help any any at all. Um... So that's my ISOM review. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not more of a positive poly. I really want it to be. Um, but it is what it is.
Uh, thank you for your support on the Gumroad. I appreciate it. And see you next time. Bye-bye.